There's a famous story in the Bible of a lawyer talking to Jesus, and the topic quickly changes from what must I do to inherit eternal life to his neighbor. So today we're here not to talk about you, but we're here to talk about your neighbor. Welcome to Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Kingdom Speak. So today we're here to talk about our neighbors. Doesn't that sound fun? (laughs) Have you seen what your neighbors are doing? (laughs) If only this was all conjecture. (laughs) We can have a lot of fun with this today. Yes, we can. (laughs) Absolutely. So, go ahead. I think think we are... um, the, the reason we want to talk about this is because mm. there is there's there is that that sense mm. in our communities uh, with this present crisis uh, and the encouragement of those in positions of political mm. power authority uh, they are encouraging neighbors mm-hmm. to kind of snitch each other out. So that's that's why we wanted to talk about it today. And I think the Bible has an opinion about it. You always bring the Bible into this. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> so what makes a neighbor any different from anyone else? Um, I, I think to really get the proper definition mm-hmm. and seeing how we've already brought the Bible into it, we need to look biblically at, at what does the Word of God say about a neighbor, and how does that affect my responsibility or my expectation from that relationship? And uh, looking at this uh, a few weeks ago, just in, in personal reflection, I began to look through uh, the Ten Commandments. So Exodus chapter Twenty and and everybody is aware of the role that the Ten Commandments play, or they should be playing in our society. That shall have no other gods. I mean, they did at one me. time. Yeah, before we took them out of our schools, and so thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Mm-hmm. And we can go through the list. I think. I think first of all, it's important that. Um, maybe we view these because we know that Moses wrote it down on tables of stone and almost as in five, five and five and an even, mm-hmm. an even separation when really there is a pretty clear delineation between the first four Ten Commandments and the remaining six. There is a vertical, horizontal intersect mm-hmm when we're looking at the Ten Commandments. So the first four are definitely dealing with man and his responsibility to God. No other gods before me. Right. No graven Graven images. images. Yes. Uh, Don't take the the Lord, the God, yes, and the Sabbath. And remember the Sabbath. Then there is a clear shift in the narrative with honor thy father and mother. Mm, Gets personal. Thou shalt not kill, Mm -hmm. thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. And when we are reading through Exodus 20, we find a reoccurring theme in this latter part of of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Mm -hmm. thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And so I find it really intriguing that two-tenths mm-hmm. of the Ten Commandments deal specifically with the role of our neighbor and our relationship wow. um, with them back and forth. And specifically, when we're speaking in relation to the present climate of of the encouragement of if you see your neighbor doing mm-hmm. call 1-800 mm-hmm. 
send a pitcher. Um, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Mm. I've I've read two articles in the last uh, few days, and both of them, uh, from a psychological standpoint, have raised the fact that societally we are undermining the the fabric that holds us together by encouraging neighbors to be suspicious of each other instead of being tolerant. Yeah, well, it really does flip on on its head what we should be doing for each other, you know, looking out for each other, checking in, hey, are you doing all right? Are you guys okay? Absolutely. It flips it on its head, um, and it undermines trust, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm sure there's there's a, a good intention behind it, you know, looking out for the public, but then we sacrifice our neighbors. And what you don't want to live somewhere. And where is that line? Yeah, you don't want to live somewhere where your neighbors hate you. Exactly right. Exactly. So I think there's an opportunity here mm. for the church to demonstrate mm -hmm. what role a neighbor plays. Um, and I, I really think that we find this balance. Mm hmm in the Ten Commandments, because if my vertical relationship is right, then my horizontal relationships yeah, very good. will very good. reflect that proper relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. So if anybody needs to be able to demonstrate this is what a neighbor is, and this is the role and responsibility mm -hmm. that I have to you as my neighbor, it should be the church. It should be us who have that relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's an interesting phrase in this story uh, where it says a lawyer questions Jesus and he says he was trying to justify himself. Ooh. That's never a good thing when you're talking to Jesus. Yeah. And from a from a from a law perspective, he, he was probably doing it at an even higher level. Absolutely. At an expert level, he was analytically trying to Absolutely. get him off the hook. Yeah. Definitely a legalistic approach. Yes. Yes. And so it's it's intriguing to me that he starts not, the conversation does not start about neighbors, mm -hmm. but it starts rather talking about how do I inherit eternal life? Yeah, that's right. It seems his approach to Jesus was, you know, uh, he was taking it at face value and an innocent question, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. But it was a legal loophole the whole time, seems like. Exactly. Well, and, and so Jesus, Jesus responds back because he has an advantage that none of us have. Unfair. Right. He knows who he's speaking to, so he automatically speaks to him in the terminology that... Mm. that best relates with this attorney and he says all right seems how you're an attorney what does the law say yeah, let's dive in about <laughs> inheriting eternal life and how do you read the law hmm. and that is when the attorney responds back with thou shalt love the lord thy god with all of thine heart with all of thy soul with all of thy strength, with all of mm -hmm. thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. I just threw it in at the end. He did. He did. But do you know what? He knew it because let, let's 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 bring it all in. It's not just the Ten Commandments. We understand that Jesus also said that the greatest law is exactly. to love God, right. and then to love thy neighbor as thyself. And on this, everything hangs all the law and the prophets. Yeah. That young attorney knew that. And so when Jesus heard that, he said, you've answered right. Mm -hmm. This do, and you will live. And if he'd have just stopped oh. there. <laughs> oh, a personal lesson. <laughs> I wonder how many times he regretted not letting it just drop just with leave that. leave it alone. But... I think it's important to mm. note here that at least it would appear like the reason that we even have the story that we have labeled the Good Samaritan mm -hmm. is because that attorney tried to justify himself. 
he willing to justify himself. Quite obvious, Jesus knew this attorney's problem is not loving me. Right. Mm-hmm. It is his interaction with his neighbors. So you have well said, mm. this do and you shall live. Mm-hmm. And so the attorney's response at that point in an attempt of, at self-justification, he said, so who is my neighbor? You can almost, you can almost pick up a little bit of the, the edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think he knew that Jesus had his number. Because if your neighbor is the right person, then it becomes easier to love them as yourself. Absolutely. Right? But not that neighbor on that side of the house, right? You want to pick that one. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you have, if we're not careful, before we all jump on the, you know, bash the attorney bandwagon, mm. um, I, I think there is an application here for every one of us. And that is this. We don't know the attorney's name. Mm-hmm. And then as Jesus begins unpacking the parable of the Good Samaritan, Mm -hmm. we don't know the name of the man that fell. We don't know the name of the Levite. We don't know the name of the priest or the name of the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. This particular passage is riddled with a certain lawyer and a certain man and a certain priest, a certain Levite, Mm -hmm. a certain Samaritan. And so a commonly practiced and held belief and understanding is that whenever the phrase phrase, certain man, certain woman Mm -hmm. is used in Scripture, that it is hermeneutically acceptable for you to substitute yourself into the narrative. There's, There's enough flexibility in the narrative that you can punch yourself in wherever you think you best fit Mm -hmm. and, and, and then interpret the storyline. So I think it's important that, uh, when we're reading this, we don't just make it about some, some, uh, pre Calvary attorney. Yeah. That, that is, his loose lips are getting oh, him into... Them. That was right. for them. <laughs> I think a good question to ask yourself is, who am I in yeah. this story? And I think I think everyone listening to this podcast right now, there's a probability that they may find themselves mm-hmm. in any one of the roles. Maybe the donkey. <laughs> I'll let you play that role. <laughs> It does not say a certain donkey. No, it doesn't. It does not say a certain donkey. (laughs) Uh, We digress, yes. Yes, but it may be that you are the attorney. Mm. Yeah, you're looking for that loophole. Exactly, but Mm. it may be that you're the man that has fallen among thieves, or it may be that you are the certain Levite. So Mm. I think think when we're looking at this passage and this parable, we need to look at it from where do I fit into this narrative okay so let's jump ahead to this um when again when you read that story as a whole and in preparation for this i've been reading this we call this you know hey boys and girls let's talk about the good samaritan right right but nowhere do we do we read that? And that's not in scripture. Absolutely. It's almost a story about a lawyer and then how everybody's reaction to the man that was wounded. It's a it's he's a bit not, of a different angle. Yeah, he's not a good Samaritan in scripture. He is a certain mm-hmm. Samaritan. Um, I think I think that you would be hard pressed to have found a Jew in that setting that would have called any Samaritan good. The, the animosity between mm-hmm. the Jews and the Samaritans was deep-rooted. And I think Jesus is probably getting to the heart of the matter. So you think he went straight for the, the jugular in a sense where he Absolutely. made the, the worst-case scenario and said, okay, now do you still love me? <laughs> exactly. And do you still want eternal life? Right. Yeah. And remember, this is in response to the question, yeah. who is my neighbor? Right. Who is my neighbor? Mm. 
it, it's not just someone whose civic address mm-hmm. is the next number down from mine, or it's not just someone whose yard is is a is adjacent to mine. But Jesus is letting him know it could be a Samaritan. Wow. And so I I really I, I feel like um and, and and I don't want to get into all of the the history of this, mm-hmm. but but Jesus was really striking at the heart of that legalistic approach. I'm going to give myself a pass Mm -hmm. because I don't think you qualify to be my neighbor. And when you look at it from that perspective, there is a, there is a major danger in interpreting biblical principles and boy, we're all guilty of this. Mm-hmm. Through the lens of how you're supposed to treat me, okay, instead of my responsibility to you. So Jesus, hmm. Jesus lets him know this. Let's let's unpack this a bit and 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 come back to that. Jesus tells him a certain man mm-hmm. is is making his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He fell amongst thieves, and boy, there's a good a good side note here that it's 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 very important where you fall. Yes, even just men fall, so it's not a matter of whether you will fall; it's a matter of where you will fall. And he just happened to fall in the wrong place. He fell amongst thieves. They strip him of everything he has. Mm-hmm. They rob him, even potentially of life itself. And they leave him there. And the narrative goes on to say that a priest came by. Mm -hmm. And when he observed the man in that condition, he walks to the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. And then a Levite comes by. And likewise, he takes the same approach that the priest took. And he walks to the other side of the road. And he is, he's, he's, I, I I would venture to say there was a bit of over the shoulder. Yeah, where's the camera? Right. <laughs> over the, okay, nobody's looking. It's just me and him. Uh, I'm not his neighbor. It's like walking by, you know, the piece of litter in the parking lot. And you're like, I really should pick that up. I really don't want to. Right. I really should do that. That's right. the right thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm convinced that each of them knew that they had a responsibility to that man. That's the point Jesus is driving yeah. here. But they all walked right on by. Mm-hmm. And I think I think it's important to note at this point in the narrative that our world does not need more organized religion. No, that's right. Mm. Our world needs neighbors. Mm-hmm. Someone who fills the role of a neighbor as defined by well and if you extrapolate commandments. if you extrapolate those numbers off the the story it seems like neighbors are in the minority for sure right so two two walk by so one of three right tend to do the right thing that's that's not very heartening statistics well and it's not just that when you dial it in even tighter it's it's the fact that sometimes religious people are the least neighborly. Whoa, yes. Because but we tend to look and find the loopholes. <laughs> we exactly we tend to look at it mm-hmm. because we know the law mm-hmm. and we're looking at it legalistically. And if we're not careful, we're also looking at it from a point of self justification. Mm-hmm. And so when. When Jesus, I think that the attorney was with Jesus the whole way through the narrative. Mm-hmm. The whole way through the narrative. The Levite passed him by. Ah, I wouldn't have passed him by. The priest passed him by. Ah, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have passed him by. But when Jesus mentioned that it was a Samaritan mm-hmm. that stopped and began to fulfill that neighborly duty, I think that struck a chord in the heart of that of, of that attorney who's standing there. Remember, 
this whole discussion is taking place with 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 a crowd of people there that Jesus had been teaching yeah. and one attorney standing there questioning him. And at that moment, I think the attorney was regretting that attempt at self-justification a thousand times over. Yeah, and just talking about this just came to me. You know, if you if you study any sort of famous presentations by lawyers, sure. it all leads up to a question at the end. Exactly. That you force the exactly. defense or the you know, the district attorney to answer, and then you say, I arrest my case. It's like Jesus led the lawyer all along this path, and then he said, okay, now which of these three do you think <laughs> was yeah. a neighbor? Right. I arrest my case. Right. He walked away. Okay, so you're, you're bringing out to me what I think is, is that cliffhanger moment. Yeah. Okay? The narrative started with an attorney saying, so who's my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And Jesus brings him full circle and ends with a question saying, which of the three mm. were a neighbor unto him? That's right. So the biblical principle is not the measuring stick that I get to use to determine whether or not you're being a neighbor to me, mm. but it's more about what my responsibility is to you. Which of the three were a neighbor unto him? So I need to sit at home and ask myself, not how my neighbors treat me, but how I treat my neighbors. Exactly right. But it's so hard to be nice to somebody when they're not necessarily nice to you. Help us out with this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what that, I think that's right. why Jesus <laughs> has this parable. In the first place, I think that's why it's in the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. I've had this discussion even in recent weeks. How do I respond to a neighbor that is being critical of me, that, that I am suspect is snitching on me? Mm -hmm. And the response has to come back to, who's being the neighbor here anyway? And so I think Jesus demonstrates this in another account when he looks at the disciples and says um we we're, we're getting ready to depart into galilee but i must needs go through samaria mm -hmm. jesus by this account in john chapter 4 was not expecting anything out of this attorney that he was not demonstrating himself so you think it was intentional, the whole Samaria thing? I believe it was because of the history of the animosity between the Jews. So he would have done this to and exemplify the that he was willing to practice what he preached. Absolutely. Mm. And Jesus makes his way to the well, and he sits on the side of the well, and he waits in Samaria mm. for that lady to come out. And, and what does she try to do? She tries to make it a conversation piece about religiosity. Mm -hmm. My father's worshipped on this mountain. Your father's worshipped on this mountain. You being a Jew, how you dare ask any, anything of me being a Samaritan? You pick up the same feeling. It's like a cultural divide. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think the takeaway... Yeah from this is that we're not just supposed to be neighbors to apostolics. Mm -hmm. We're not just supposed to be neighbors to our own race. That's right. Yep. We are supposed to exemplify our relationship with Jesus Christ by how we treat those around us. And yeah, and it makes total sense that what good is, you know, your, if you want to call it religion or your faith, um, if you can't even treat your neighbor properly. <laughs> exactly. Which is why Jesus would have said, everything hangs on this. Like, if you don't get this right, forget about everything else. And, and I, that is the concern of what we are seeing erode mm -hmm. in our communities right now. Mm -hmm. As a part of the response to this COVID crisis, it is a political response that is literally attacking mm -hmm. 
a spiritual responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it is encouraging everybody to walk to the other side of the road. And if you're bleeding out, help yourself. Um, but we need somebody that regardless of that is willing to exemplify, I will pick you up. I will bind your wounds. I will put you on my beast. I will take you to the innkeeper. Mm. And I will pay whatever price it is for you. To and that's be quite a statement to leave your credit card on the desk and say, I'll be back. Settle it up. Absolutely. And I think no holds barred. No, zero holds barred. Right. Open ended tab. And I will I, I will venture to say that this is an opportunity for the church of the living God to demonstrate to our world right now. Mm -hmm. If we've ever needed and, 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 and this is, this is super practical, mm -hmm. but if we've ever needed to reach out to our communities, it's right now. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a dozen homemade cookies yes. dropped off to I a neighbor. My neighbors are watching. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a big yeah. deal. It can be a card in the mail. That's right. When, when everybody is being the, the 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 narrative of social distancing social distancing social distancing um i think it's time for the church to reach across that divide mm -hmm. and demonstrate there's still some good samaritans in in our world today so what i'm hearing is that i can't use this current environment as an excuse to be a bad neighbor Absolutely. Don't refuse to get drawn into the tit for tat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Our church has been reported three times mm -hmm. and has been false every time mm -hmm. through this COVID crisis mm -hmm. that we were continuing to hold services. The humanistic response to that is, boy, if I can find out who done that, <laughs> will I show you a thing or two? But the response that, that, the word of God mm. puts on the table is you don't measure this by what they're doing to you. No, you just take care of you. This is your responsibility to them. You have to become intentional with your role that yeah. you play. And, 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 and as true as everything that we're saying mm -hmm. is it's not that it's easy, mm -hmm. but it's right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I think in, in Exodus chapter 12, we see a closing example that I would like to leave here mm -hmm. of the role of the neighbor and how I think that, that all of this weaves together to what could become a catalyst for revival. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as being a neighbor can be, can be, inextricably tied to redemption. So Exodus, Exodus 12 gives us the account of the children of Israel who are getting ready mm -hmm. to leave Egypt. God is taking them out with a high hand. Mm -hmm. And Moses tells them specifically, go get a lamb, catch the blood in a basin, mm -hmm. roast it on an open fire, and then consume it. In your house, and if the house be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor, hmm. and his neighbor, next unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. And and I think there's something significant to be to be learned from this, and that is that redemption has yet to meet a household that's too big. Wow. There's always more lamb than what your house needs. So the reality is that when you've got more lamb than you've got household, when you've got more lamb than you've got souls, don't just look inward, mm -hmm. but look outward. Look at your neighbor. Invite them over and say, hey, I have got more lamb 
than what I know to do with. I have got more redemption than what I know what to do with. Are you interested? And wouldn't it just be neat mm -hmm. that when, when politically we are being encouraged to distance ourselves, mm -hmm. that the church could come at it from another angle and say, hey, if you'd like to experience the lamb, mm -hmm. I've got more lamb in my house than what I need. Could I be your neighbor? If you're struggling with depression, can I be your neighbor? If you're lonely, mm -hmm. can I be your neighbor? If you're suicidal, can I be your neighbor? Not just in the sense of just looking so narrowly that it's the guy beside me, but what, what if it's the guy uptown? Mm. What if it's the guy in another neighborhood? I believe that the church has the answer to what this world needs. And could it be just as simple as being a neighbor? There, you just heard it. It's time to get up from wherever you were listening to this podcast. Go find your neighbor. Be nice to him. So thanks again for joining us on Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop. Be sure to like, subscribe, rate, review, follow, all of those things. Let us know in the comments how you enjoy Kingdom Speak, if you do enjoy it, of course. And be sure to come again next time for another episode of Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop.